Wow, that was good. Hit zero, music goes down, didn't have to say a word. Good morning, beloved brethren. My very strong desire for our flock today is that we will have a passion for God's word and a passion to receive his word into our hearts so that we may grow spiritually. 1 Peter 2, 2 says, Like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. And so let's go ahead and pray to that end right now. Before we get into the word, <clears throat> let's pray for God to give us that desire. Those in the hallway, you want to come on in? Let's get started. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I just want to ask that you would give us all, all of us, God, a longing heart, <clears throat> longing for the pure milk of the word, longing to be in love with you so that we may grow in respect to our salvation. Lord, for some of us, it may <clears throat> require that you restore to us the joy of our salvation. And I want to pray, Lord God, that you would do that work in our hearts today. Lord, that you would light a fire in our souls, that you would ignite a flame in our bones. Lord, that we would love you with all of our hearts, souls, minds, strength. Lord, that we would quit making excuses about our lack of strength and realize that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. <clears throat> so Father, would you meet us here today and would you touch your church today? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat> Well, today we're going to continue <clears throat> our verse-by-verse -verse study of Ephesians. <clears throat> Last week, we left off in chapter 5, and we covered verses 1 and 2. And it was there that Paul <clears throat> exhorted the Ephesians, <clears throat> chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. He exhorted the Ephesians, and he's, he's exhorting us, obviously, to be imitators of God. And notice it says, as his beloved children. <clears throat> as his beloved children <clears throat> who are in a very personal relationship with him. And he told us in verse 2 <clears throat> that we're to walk in love. And this is the sacrificial love that Christ walked in as he gave himself over to the will of the Father. And so we're to seek to be a fragrant aroma, a sweet savor unto God. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I want to move on to the next section. I don't want to drag our heels, <clears throat> but as we were sitting there worshiping, something just, I felt quickened in my heart, and I wasn't going to do this till later on, but I'm going to take a couple of minutes just to... Uh, make every one of us aware of something that I think is very important. Now, this letter was written to the Ephesians, right? We already know that. But it's interesting to think about <clears throat> what eventually became the testimony of the Ephesians a little bit later on, not too long after this letter was written. And when I say not too long, it could have been 15 years, 20 years, but in the greater scheme of things, that's not really that long. So what I'd like us to do is keep a finger here in Ephesians 5 and turn to the right to the book of Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 2. Revelations, Revelation chapters 2 and 3 consist of the seven letters written to seven churches. Seven churches there... <clears throat> in the Asia, Asia Minor area. 
<clears throat> perhaps we would call it Eastern Europe today. <clears throat> and the first one in chapter 2, verse 1, the first letter that Jesus commanded John to write was to the church in Ephesus. And I find this to be very interesting in light of what Paul is telling them in verses 1 and 2 of Ephesians chapter 5. Revelation chapter 2 verse 1 says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false and have and you have perseverance and have endured and have endured excuse me I lost my place for my name's sake and have not grown weary but I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Now there's a lot of opinions about what that means. And I'm not even going to try to fill in all the blanks. <clears throat> but I do know that back in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, we're told to be imitators of God as beloved children. And the reason it says beloved children is uh, that's telling us, it's emphasizing again that relational aspect. You guys, those of you who are married, perhaps know what it's like when you started off with your spouse and there was a love there. You, you bought her flowers, you took her out to dinner, you romanced your spouse. If you're a guy, you romanced your spouse because you were in love with her. And then as the years go on, you get kind of used to each other. You, you almost become pieces of furniture in the house. You just take, what I mean by that is you take it for granted. It's just there, right? And the romance is gone. That, by the way, if the romance is gone, is something you need to work on immediately because it's a bad thing to have the romance be gone in a marriage. But <clears throat> when the romance is gone, when there's no longer that fire there isn't that inner burning inside to want to do great things for the person you love anymore. Now it just becomes routine. You may still go through the routine, but the fire's gone. So whatever the first love is for the ch church of Ephesus, the fire was now gone, Jesus said. They lost their first love. Now, chapter 5, not only says in verse 1 that they're beloved children, but they're told in verse 2 to walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice of God as a fragrant aroma. <clears throat> you never get that sense in the life of Jesus that he's sort of dragging his heels in terms of his wanting to do the will of the Father. Oh, the will of the Father again. We don't get that sense at all and it's because, well, it's impossible that we could because Jesus was the son of God. But we're told to be imitators of God and we're told to imitate Christ. And we're told to imitate Christ in light of <clears throat> all the things that we're commanded to do as Christians. We're told to be on fire for God. Romans 12 <clears throat> says, be fervent in spirit. In other words, let let the Spirit rise up within us. And so we're reading through all these various commands. And by the way, notice in verse 5 there, Jesus said, Therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. In other words, stir up that passion. Where's your love for me? Where's the fire you're supposed to have for me? The fire to obey me. The fire, the fire to seek me out. The fire to tell other people about me. Where is the love? Repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I'm coming to you and I'll remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. 
Now those are heavy words right there. In other words, I'm going to take your light away. You'll cease to function in the capacity that you were commanded to function in because the fire's gone. Just, just the shell is there, no light. It just exists. <clears throat> you know what a horrible thing it is to see a marriage that just exists? The people live together? That's about it. They just live together. No fire. So I wanted to remind all of us that as we're going through chapter 5, you can flip on back there. <clears throat> I want us to remember that what we're talking about in terms of all these things that we're being commanded to do, and there's a lot of commands, and we're going to see a number of them today, and all these things that we're commanded to do, there is a person behind these commands, and it's the Lord Jesus. And supremely, we are to love him. And everything that we are being commanded to do that we'll see in a minute, we're doing it because we love the person of Christ. And so when the Lord says, do this, we do it because we love that person. <clears throat> do you love your spouse? Do you love your children? When you look at your children, does your heart just light up? Do your eyes light I love to watch my children. I was sitting there staring at a picture of two of my children yesterday. I must have stared at it for five minutes. And I was just imagining. I was going back in my mind, remembering when they were babies, holding them. Because my children are dear in my sight. Very dear. And so is my wife. I cherish my wife. I love my wife. And I don't ever want to lose that fire for her. I can tell you before God, in 22 years of marriage, I love her more now than I did when we got married. I do. I genuinely do. And that's what we're after in our relationship with Christ, isn't it? That's what we're after in our relationship with God. Why do we assemble as a church? I was thinking about during the worship time, how whether or not our hearts are actually ignited when we come here. Or is it just a chore to get here? We're, we're, we're just lucky to get through the service alive. <laughs> Will I make it out of here today? Or is there a fire in your bones that says this is where I need to be? This is where the light of Christ is. This is where my love for Christ is challenged. This is where I grow. If it's not, then you come to church for the wrong reasons. Don't stop coming. Repent and come for the right reasons. Amen? Amen? So back in Ephesians chapter 5, <clears throat> verses 1 and 2 set us up for a new section. Verse 3 begins <clears throat> with another one of those conjunctions. <laughs> the word but carries the exhortation over to a prohibition that's expressed in the strongest terms. And it functions to introduce a new set of moral exhortations. Paul begins with an appeal for the readers to eliminate immorality from their lives. Let's take a look. Verses three and four. You know, let's just read one and two real quick. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Verse three, but immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Now, backing up to verse 3, <clears throat> the first, the second word there in verse 3, the word that's translated in the New American Standard as immorality, that word is translated as fornication in the King James Version. Now, whenever this word is used in the same verse as adultery, 
then fornication means illicit intercourse among unmarried persons. However, when, as here, it is not distinguished from adultery, it refers to any form of sexual immorality. This would include uh, premarital sex, it would include adultery, uh, <clears throat> a sexual liaison with a prostitute, homosexual liaisons, incestuous relationships, fill in the blank. Now Jesus spoke of sexual immorality as one of the evils that flows from a corrupt heart. Elsewhere, Paul lists it as one of the deeds of the flesh in Galatians 5.19. The second term that Paul uses there in verse 3 in Paul's list of things to avoid is the word impurity, which was discussed back in chapter 4, verse 19. Now, even though under the old covenant, the word was for impurity was actually used to refer to various kinds of ritual impurity, <clears throat> Jesus pointed to the deeper issue of the corruption in the hearts of individuals which renders them impure. You can read that in Mark 7.20. There are a variety of thoughts and behaviors that constitute impurity under the new covenant, but sexual immorality is one of the most prominent. And Paul explicitly links them in several contexts and the connection is actually implicit in Galatians 5.19 where we're given the, the works of the flesh and in Colossians 3.5 and here and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 the connection is made there as well and we're going to turn to, the, turn to that in just a moment. <clears throat> But let me just say that illicit sexual activity was an enormous problem for new Gentile Christians to overcome in the early church. Adulterous relationships, men sleeping with their slave girls, incest, prostitute, prostitution, excuse me, sacred sexual encounters in the local temples, and even homosexuality were all a part of everyday life for the Ephesians. There was not an accepted social standard with regard to sexual relations, even though there were some Stoics who spoke against the prevailing practices in Roman society because they represented a lack of control over the passions. Rampant Sexual immorality in the Greco-Roman society was why the Jews had long been appalled at the behavior of the Gentiles in this regard and considered them impure. But we don't have to dip into the annals of ancient history to smell the stench of immorality. We are dealing with this problem in epic proportions in our own era of time. Contemporary sexual madness has even found its way into the church. The influence of the lustful world has been so pervasive and the church so weak and undiscerning that many Christians have become convinced that all sorts of sexual excesses and impurities are covered by grace or can be rendered morally safe if engaged in with the right attitude, especially if some scripture verses can be twisted to give seeming support. But immorality and impurity cannot be sanctified or modified into anything other than what they are. And the New Testament clearly teaches that there is no place for that in the Christian life. Now, if you'll turn to, with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I'd like to just give you a quick glimpse at <clears throat> really one of the foundational sections in the New Testament concerning the sin of sexual immorality. The other one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're not going to go there today. We went there back when we were in Galatians chapter 5. 
You can read that on your own about what Paul says about the body being the temple of the Holy Spirit. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I think the point will be well made. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, <coughs> excuse me, verse 1, we read the following. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. That sounds like the beginning of Ephesians 5. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel and sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So I think the point is very well made that one of the primary aspects of sanctification is the, is the abstinence of sexual immorality. But notice that Paul says in verse 4 that we should know how to possess this vessel. Now that has the language of 1 Corinthians 6, this vessel being the human body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who don't know God. We would expect that from the Gentiles, from unbelievers. They don't know God. But that no man transgress and defraud. That's an interesting way of putting the sin of, of sexual immorality as a defrauding of another human being because you are engaging in something that is unlawful. You are engaging in something that the God has not designed the body to do. The body is not ours to do with what we want with it. Women who cry out for their, their, the right to their body to abort their babies. That body's not theirs. That baby's not theirs. It's God's. God has allowed them to house that baby, but it's not theirs. And so we, and for all of us, our bodies are not ours, Paul told us. They belong to God. And so we can't just use our bodies to do what we want with. We have to do what God says needs to be done with the body. Ephes excuse me, uh, Hebrews 13.4 says that marriage is to be held in honor among all and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers. God will judge. Now there we see fornication, the word being used with adulterers. So there are distinctions there. There's there's adultery, which I think most of us know what adultery is. And then there's fornication, sex outside of a marriage. Adultery, of course, is when a married person commits sexual immorality with a person he's not married to. So <clears throat> there you have it, 1 Thessalonians 4. You can flip on back to Ephesians. Now, uh, I will not inundate you with statistics and antidotes, <laughs> uh, but I do want to give you just a couple of uh, two glaring examples in contemporary culture of the moral crisis that we are in today. One example is in the church. I was reading an article that was actually put out by Pew Research, and uh, the name of the article is Where Christian Churches and other religions stand on gay marriage. Now, I think we, most of us know where that one's going, right? With the gay marriage thing. This one article said that last week's Supreme, this was July 2nd, by the way, last week's Supreme Court ruling legalizing same-sex marriage nationwide, nationwide raised questions about how the decision will affect religious groups especially those that continue to oppose allowing gay and lesbian couples to wed. The, church's, the court's ruling makes clear that clergy and religious organizations are not obliged to perform 
same-sex marriages, but some groups have expressed concerns about their tax-exempt status. Many of the largest U.S. religious institutions have remained firmly against allowing same-sex marriage, and then it gives a list of them. But, of course, at the same time, in the last two decades, several other religious groups also have moved to allow same-sex couples to marry within their traditions. And then it gives a list of those. It goes on to say that this list is growing. Clergy from the Episcopal Church will be able to perform same-sex marriage ceremonies after the church's general convention approved a new definition of marriage this week. Another mainline Protestant denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA, voted to formally sanction same-sex same -sex marriage earlier this year. By the way, same-sex, if I say that real fast, that's always a tongue twister for me, so forgive me. If I butcher it, just forgive me. <clears throat> Among the four largest mainline Protestant churches, the same-sex marriage debate has not been simple. The United Methodist Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and the Presbyterian Church U USA, uh, and the Episcopal Church have wrestled with the issue for years, often as part of a larger debate on the role of gays and lesbians in the church. Overall, a solid majority of white mainline Protestants, 62%, now favor allowing gays and lesbians to wed with just 33% opposed, according to a 2015 Pew Research Center survey. A similar share say there's no conflict between their religious beliefs and homosexuality. Now, we've heard so much about the homosexual same-sex issue. It's ad nauseum. We've just heard so much about it. But obviously, the thing that makes it so startling is the fact that we are sanctioning this practice in the church, right? Think of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the issue there at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when the church allowed someone to carry on in their immorality, weren't doing anything about it. In fact, they were actually, there was actually some pride over it. And Paul rebuked them. What, what are you doing? What are you allowing? So that's the church. Now, one other example of the permeation of immorality in our society. In fact, I would even say it, it, it equals the sophisticated prostitution that existed uh, during the time of Ephesus and, and the Corinthian church where there was the temple prostitution of antiquity. How many of you heard, have heard about the uh, Ashley Madison incident? Anybody heard about that? Ashley Madison is a Canada-based online dating service and social networking service marketed to people who are married or in a committed relationship. Its slogan is, life is short, have an affair. From their website, <clears throat> this is from their website. Yes, I had to go there to get this. <laughs> go right to the source, right? My wife knows. <laughs> Ashley Madison is the most famous name in infidelity and married dating. Ashley Madison is the most successful website for finding an affair and cheating partners. Have an affair today on Ashley Madison. Thousands of cheating wives and cheating husbands sign up every day looking for an affair. We are the most famous web website for discreet encounters between married individuals. Married dating has never been easier. With our guarantee, with our affair guarantee package, we guarantee you will find the perfect affair partner. Now, of course, the company is receiving attention right now because on July 15th, 2015, hackers stole all of its customer data, including emails, names, home addresses, and credit card information and everything they were looking for and threatened to post all the online data if Ashley Madison and some fellow 
company were not permanently closed. On July 22nd, the first names of the customers were released by the hackers and all of the user data was released on August 18th of this year, just a month ago, a little over a month ago. More data, including some of the CEO's emails, was released on August 20th. So much for having a discreet affair, right? And of course, you know, that made headlines <laughs> as people's names were being published, published all over the internet. So it's never been easier to commit the sins that we're seeing there, immorality and impurity. It's never been easier to commit these two sins in the history of the world as it is today. And there is massive confusion over sexual ethics today. And our federal government is leading the charge in making immorality as accessible to the populace as possible. You want to hear something bizarre? I picked up a copy of the Constitution. You can get this on Amazon. It's the Declaration of Independence and the Articles of Confederation. So I thought, oh, that's cool. I'm going to go ahead and read through the Constitution. So I've got some highlights in there. I was reading through it. And then listen to this. This is the disclaimer. At the beginning of the Constitution, this one is put out by Wilder or Wilder, I think it's Wilder, Wilder Publications. Here's the disclaimer in the beginning. This book is a product of its time and does not reflect the same values as it would if it were written today. Parents might wish to discuss with their children how views on race, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and interpersonal relations have changed since this book was written before allowing them to read this classic work. I thought this was the laws of our land. <laughs> Sexual ethics. We are very confused today. Anyway, just thought I would bless you by reading that to you. <laughs> Pretty scary, huh? <clears throat> And I don't ever read those things, the copyright thing and the stuff in the beginning, whoever reads that, right? But whoa, kind of blew me away. Verse three also says, impurity or greed must not be named among you as is proper among saints. Now, as mentioned under the discussion of Ephesians 4.19, greed is inseparable from impurity. Every form of sexual immorality is an expression of the self-will, self-gratification, and self-centeredness of greed. It is by nature contrary to love, which is self-giving. Immorality and impurity are but forms of greed in the realm of sexual sin. They are manifestations of sexual covetousness and express counterfeit love masquerading as something beautiful, good, and rewarding. Haven't you ever heard two people, seen two people fornicating who say, but we love each other so much. How could what feels so right be so wrong? Have you ever said that? How could this that just feels so good be so wrong? Interesting. Because those sins seem so attractive and promising, spouses can be forsaken, children can be neglected, homes destroyed, friends are disregarded. As no effort is spared to fulfill the desire to have the one who is lusted after, all of that in the name of love, right? Because of the very strong sexual nature of human beings, sexual sins are powerful and can become perverted in unimaginable ways. If given free reign, sexual sins lead to complete insensitivity to the feelings and welfare of others. Remember Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy? Sexual immorality led to the complete insensitivity to the feelings and welfare of others in their lives 
to horrible brutality and in their, in their case, murder. And we see those stories daily in the news, don't we? And that is why the sins of immorality or impurity or greed should not even, as it says there, <clears throat> be named among Christians as is proper among saints. Now, when Paul says that these practices should not even be named among God's people, he's not saying that they shouldn't be talked about or discussed. We're doing that right now. What he's saying is that an outsider who observes the daily behavior of Christians, they should never have an opportunity to name one of these vices as characterizing the lifestyle of any member of the community. Or similarly, that an insider may never see any fellow believer committing one of these sinful practices. Now, there in verse 3, the verb named, this is an unusual usage of this verb, which normally refers to giving someone a name or calling someone by name. But here it seems best to understand Paul as using the verb in the sense of characterizing someone's lifestyle or behavior. That is, naming a trait as a hallmark feature of who they are. And then we have the conjunction there in verse 3, as is proper among saints. This, that phrase, as is, supplies the reason why these practices should be resisted and done away with. It is proper, it is fitting for believers not to engage in them. Paul stresses here that such conduct is utterly inconsistent with their new identity as God's chosen people. They are no longer Gentile sinners, but a new creation that is like God in righteousness and holiness. So in other words, the tail end of verse 3 is letting us know that there's no wiggle room for justifying licentiousness. God's not going to, he's not going to wink at it. He's not going to wink at it. But he doesn't stop there. Look at verse 4 again. <clears throat> and there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks. Now here, Paul continues his warning against this perversion of love by mentioning an extensive list of related sins that is sure to cover every believer at one time or another. Not only, are Christ not only should Christians never engage in sexual sins of any kind, <coughs> but they should never be guilty of these sins listed in verse four. The word for filthiness, that word there has to do with, with general obscenity, any talk that is degrading and disgraceful. It is actually related to the term found in Colossians 3.8, which means dirty speech. The phrase silly talk, used only here in the New Testament, is actually derived from two words. It's derived from the Greek word moros, moros, which means dull or stupid. And yes, it's the word from which we get moron. And the word lego, which means to speak. Here it's referring to, to stupid talk. Talk only befitting someone who is intellectually deficient. It is sometimes referred to as low obscenity, foolish talk that comes from the drunk or the gutter mouth. And it has no point except to give an air of dirty worldliness. I walk outside the doors of my house and that's all I hear in the conversation coming from the neighbors. Just expletives. Just, that's, that's all that's, that comes out. 50% of their conversation is expletives. And then there's the term coarse jesting. This refers to talk that is more pointed and determined. It carries the idea of quickly turning something that is said or done, no matter how innocent, 
and to that which is obscene or suggestive. It is the filthy talk of a person who uses every word and circumstance, circumstance to display his immoral wit. It is the stock and trade of the clever talk show host who is never at a loss for a sexual innuendo. But the low obscenity of silly talk and the high obscenity of coarse jesting comes from the same kind of heart, a heart that is given over to moral filthiness. Please don't come and tell me your dirty joke. I don't want to hear it. It's offensive to God. Some of the shop talk around the shop can be like that. If your coworkers are getting into that, <laughs> rebuke them and walk away. <laughs> but notice in verse four, it doesn't stop there. There's a, there's a solution, right? But rather giving of thanks. So instead of being involved in immorality or filthy speaking, the believer's mouth should be involved in the giving of thanks. We have another conjunction there, the word but. And with that conjunction, Paul gives one of the immediate reasons for living life with a heart of thanksgiving. Believers are unlike those who are trapped in a lifestyle characterized by sin. The redeemed now have an inheritance in the kingdom. The believer's heart should be too preoccupied with his new life for his mouth to be in the gutter because everything has changed. Instead of using others, instead of using them, he now serves others. Instead of trying to turn the innocent into the immoral, he seeks to change the immoral into what is righteous and holy. He is thankful because the holy life is a satisfying life and people see love for God in the thankful person. Think about it. What comes out of our mouths is that not a reflection of what's in our hearts. And so <clears throat> the person who is living for God hopefully has a life that's so satisfied in that relationship that it just flows right out of the mouth. Verses five and six. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So here we have a very strong reminder to the Ephesians in a similar style as we saw back in chapter 2 when he reminded them of the lifestyle that they came out of. Here he's showing them the fate that's going to engulf those who practice the very sins they left behind. And here we are made aware of the consequences of a life lived without surrender to Christ. The need for serious moral change now receives its strongest argument our eternal destiny. We are accustomed to various kinds of appeals that preachers use to motivate people to become converted to Christ. But beyond the invitation to peace or a fulfilled life or the joy of salvation and so forth, there is a starkly different kind of approach that one does not often hear anymore. And that is the threat of unending separation from God, of eternal loneliness, of the blackest darkness forever, the threat of hell itself. Notice he begins in verse five, this you know with certainty. In other words, they were not in the dark about this. They were absolutely convinced of the truth of which is calling their <coughs> attention of which Paul is calling their attention to once again. You guys are aware of this. You've known this from the beginning, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater, 
pe persons who characterize, who are characterized by the sins that Paul has just condemned in, the, in verses 3 and 4, he says, will have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. No person whose life pattern is one of habitual immorality or impurity and greed can be a part of God's kingdom because no such person can belong to him. This would contradict the truths of Romans 6, of 2 Corinthians 5.17, where it says that everyone who is in Christ is a new, creature, new creation, as well as the instruction in 1 John regarding the characteristics of believers. Read 1 John. It gives you a litmus test to know whether you're in. The life described here testifies to an unredeemed, sinful nature, no matter what relationship to Christ a person might claim to have. God's children have God's nature. And the habitually sinful person proves that he doesn't have a godly nature. And those sobering words at the tail end of verse 5, such a person has does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. The kingdom <clears throat> in which such persons have no inheritance is, notice how it's described as the kingdom of Christ's and of God's. Now, there's a tendency in Paul's letters to reserve the phrase kingdom of God for the future and eternal phrase of the heavenly kingdom and to consider the kingdom of Christ as the present phase, which is destined to merge eventually with the future phase. But those whose lives are marred by the, by the vices that Paul mentions here cannot be in any sense joint heirs with the Christ who is at present reigning until all of his, his enemies are subjugated just as they cannot hope for admission to the eternal kingdom. They are excluded from the kingdom in all of its phases, the kingdom that belong, belongs both to Christ and to God. The apostle is not saying in verse 5, he is not saying that these people are who, <clears throat> though they are in the kingdom, they are just going to suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. The subject here is salvation, not rewards. This has nothing to do with rewards. And he says in verse 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. The concern here is that someone may deceive with empty words and cause those in the church of Ephesus to become disobedient. And this is precisely the way of life <clears throat> that they used to walk, but from which they have now been redeemed. At one time they were natures, they were by nature, chapter 2, verse 3, they were by nature objects of wrath, but through God's mercy they have now been made alive. And becoming partners with such followers of evil leads to the wrath of God. Now, in this day and age, the warning here has lost none of its force. In our churches in the West, there are teachers and leaders who deceive God's people by seeking to argue that various forms of sexual immorality prohibited in Scripture are simply culturally conditioned and need not apply to Christians today. That's exactly what's going on with the homosexual movement today. Combine that false teaching with the temptation and the pressure in Western societies towards the so-called sexual freedom and personal choice and the warning of Paul in these verses must not be allowed to fall on deaf ears or to be overlooked. When we hear these kinds of things going on today where we are sanctioning immoral behavior and trying to use the scripture to do it, 
do not be deceived. God is not mocked. In fact, real quick, if you'll turn, we're almost done. We'll be done in just a minute. <clears throat> don't, don't lose me yet. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says something very similar about the fate of those who commit these unrighteous acts. It demonstrates that they are sons of disobedience. They are not sons of the Most High God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, very quickly, let's read through verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> Verse 9 says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God. But notice he says, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. This is the way you were. You're not that way anymore. But know this, that these behaviors, those who engage in these behaviors, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Real quick, we'll end with this. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21. The sobering words at the very end of the Bible <clears throat> should be enough to strike the fear of God in our hearts over the issues that Paul is dealing with with the Ephesians. Revelation chapter 21, starting at verse 5. <clears throat> and he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. Verse seven, he who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. Verse eight, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's the very same place that the apostle is talking about in Ephesians 5. Real quick, Revelation 22. Look at there. Chapter 22, verse 12. <clears throat> Jesus said in verse 12, Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Of course, Verse 13, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Verse 14, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they might have the right to the tree of life and may enter the gates into the city. Washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Amen. But, verse 15, outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons, and the murderers, and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying. There's a contrast there. There's those who are redeemed, and we know they're redeemed, because they walk in that redemption. They walk in the light as he is in the light, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses them from all sin, First John says. Walking in the light. That's how we know a person is born again. They're walking in the light. Every believer walking in the light perfectly? Nope. But they're walking in the light. Some have a greater measure of light than others. Someone might feel discouraged today. You might feel like, where am I right now? Where do I stand with God? Well, you need to get with God and Know where you stand. And, and if we've committed 
sins of immorality. As Christians, well, we need to repent. We need to turn from it. We need to turn it off or throw the computer away or, or stop flirting in the office or whatever we need to do. But what we read today, I, I'm not gonna sit up here and give you a false hope <laughs> because there are those that would give you, give you a false hope, but Ephesians 5 says, let no man deceive you. Because of these things come the wrath of God, and I can't soften that. It is what it is, and we have to line up to that, and we have to deal with that. Do we understand? Yes. Okay, we're not done. We haven't even gotten to <clears throat> verses seven and following. But uh, we'll go ahead and we'll stop right there for today. But I want us to be reminded of that first love, right? We may feel the heaviness of conviction right now. But you know, that, that conviction draws us to God. It draws us to Him. Conviction isn't sent by God to drive us away. Because where are we going to go? Right? Isn't that what the disciples said to Jesus when Jesus turned to them and said, well, you turn away also? Where are we going to go? So if the conviction's heavy on us, we turn to God. There, there may be some, some plans we have to make. When, when the people repented under Ezra, when they, were all, they had married all those strange wives, th there was a whole season of repentance. The, it took time. The, the people had to make plans. Some of them had married strange wives and had children by them. Now what are we going to do? We've just created a mess everywhere. And that's what sin does. Sin creates a mess. It creates a, it creates a mess for us personally, and it creates a mess for every, everyone around us. But don't ever let that stop us from turning to God and confessing our sins and saying, God, I want free of this. It's wrong. I want to repent of it. I want to turn to you from, turn to you from this. And, and I want freedom. I want freedom in my life. See, God gives us that freedom when he saves us. The freedom to say no to sin. We have that freedom as Christians. Non-believers don't have the freedom to say no to sin. They don't. No freedom at all. Believers do. Amen? Let's stand. <clears throat> first love. First love. Lord, bring me back to that first love where I want to be free from my sin because I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Lord, we pray that our love for you would be strong. Lord, that we would love to hear your word even when the pastor goes 15 minutes over the time he usually goes, spends in the word. Lord, our hearts need that surgery, God. And we pray that you would create that longing in us, Lord, for more of you. That our spiritual attention span would be expanded. Lord, that you would give us a greater capacity to love you. I pray, God, that you would touch this flock. Everyone, Lord, in this flock. Touch me, God. And give us that first love experience, Lord. You that love the Lord, hate evil. Lord, help us to have that perfect hatred for sin, for our own sin. <laughs> In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Don't leave here. If you need prayer, come forward. The elders will be glad to pray with you. And uh, so don't, don't just run out of here, convictions on your heart, you don't deal with it, don't do that. If you need prayer, come up front and we'll be glad to pray for you, okay?